Good evening, I'm Kim Christensen. And I'm Jennifer Meckles. The Rockies are getting ready for their home opener tomorrow, and one man is already warming up his arm. The team is honoring a Denver police sergeant who was injured in the line of duty by throwing out the first pitch. Nine News reporter Rhea Jaw spoke to Sergeant Dodge ahead of the big day. I'm a lefty, yes, so I don't know if that's good or bad. Denver Police Sergeant Justin Dodge is practicing his pitch. It's going to be as simple as I can, as long as I throw the pitch actually into the catcher's glove. Determined to make his throw count for the first pitch of the season at Coors Field. It is an honor and I'm, and I'm very blessed. During the Denver Nuggets championship parade last summer, Medical emergency, cop fell down in front of us. Dodge lost his leg after he was hit by a fire truck. I, I, I truly in my mind was starting my rehab even with the truck on top of me. Even at that moment, he knew he wouldn't let it define him. I'm an incredibly average person, but the one thing that I do have is I have drive. Eight surgeries and hundreds of hours of rehab and recovery later. Dodge is now back on track to serving full time on the DPD SWAT team. He's one of the only amputees in the department. Um, and I've tried to really make sure that things I'm doing today make tomorrow better, right? Despite Dodge's resilience and positive attitude, he acknowledges that his new life has been an adjustment. I go from a very capable person, ready to get back, team leader, operationally on a SWAT team, and at the end of the night, that leg comes off and I'm on a walker. It's that dichotomy of these, these two worlds that I live in. Dodge is doing his best day to day, and he hopes to use his story for a new purpose. I really want to help other people and show people that they can do great things. And I, I want to be able to help people become heroes of their own story. It's been a long road to get here, and now it's taken him to the pitcher's mound. There's not going to be any fastballs, curveballs, anything cool. I just want to get it. I don't want to be the, the bloopers reel. Sergeant Dodge, Sergeant Dodge says his family has been his main support system throughout his recovery, and he's especially excited to throw out his first pitch tomorrow, knowing they will be there in the stands cheering him on. In the studio, Rhea Ja, 9 News. It's incredible. It hasn't even been a year. It's Look at insane. him. He's the, unbelievable. The determination he has had is just remarkable, and the fact that he's already back at the, at the department is, is amazing. Yeah, we're lucky to have him. Right. We're lucky to have him. Thanks, Rhea. Downtown Denver is getting ready for opening day. Today, crews painted the traditional purple stripe outside of Blake Street from 22nd to 19th. Businesses are getting ready as well. Downtown Denver Partnerships says opening day ranked as the fourth busiest day for foot traffic around Coors Field last season. So it's going to be busy outside the ballpark, even if it's really quiet right now. <laughs> First pitch against the Tampa Bay Rays is set for 210 tomorrow afternoon. And it's going to be a pretty day, Kathy, but a little windy, a little windy. That's right. We have another day with temperatures in the 70s, Jenny, but there's a storm coming and the wind's really going to become a big topic of conversation tomorrow. And your opening day forecast looks like this. 15 degrees above average, 75 degrees at first pitch, 210, partly cloudy with gusty winds out of the south, 15 to 25 miles per hour. How about those high temperatures today? 83 in Lamar, 75 in Denver, 78 in Greeley. We could be as warm tomorrow, but this weekend storm brings changes starting Saturday in the form of rain, snow, and then of course that wind we've been talking about. The wind picking up over the higher passes tonight, but tomorrow the red flag warning out for critical fire weather, low humidity, warm temperatures, and gusty winds. And the leading edge of that system already spilling into western Colorado with high cloud cover there. Denver stays dry for one more day. It's a fast-moving system. A few rain and snow showers Saturday, a better Better day for baseball fans on Sunday and other than just a few high clouds tonight and tomorrow really a good looking 24 hours minus the wind but the weekend forecast I'll break that down in detail in just a bit for the second time in 24 hours somebody has been arrested for setting small fires in the Denver metro area in Lakewood tonight West Metro fire will keep an eye on burn areas around the Fox Hollow golf course Somebody set several small fires in some open spaces and wooded areas around cart paths. This started around 3 o'clock when golfers noticed the smoke. Those fires burned about five acres in total. Tonight, one person is in custody, expected to be charged with arson, intentionally causing a wildfire. And in Highlands Ranch, deputies arrested one person in connection to two small fires. Those were near South Broadway, just north of Highlands Ranch Parkway, around 7 this morning. The Delco Sheriff's Office says it might have been someone experiencing homelessness 
They're not sure if these fires were intentional or accidental. Tonight, a repairman is in jail for sexual assault. Aurora police say he was doing maintenance at a home and he assaulted two young girls. Nine News reporter Rachel Krause spoke with police who believe there could be more victims. Aurora police say Mohammed Arab bin Shamsur Alam was arrested for allegedly sexually assaulting two young girls in a home he'd been hired to help repair. It's disturbing because it happened in someone else's home. Uh, when you go to hire a repairman, you probably don't think of these things. Matthew Longshore with Aurora Police says the girls were at home when Shamsur Alam lured them into the bathroom and sexually assaulted them. We've certainly seen his behavior change in these last couple of years. Longshore is concerned Shamsur Alam's behavior is escalating. He was arrested in 2019 for indecent exposure and harassment after exposing himself to a young girl and pulling down the pants of a young boy. There's a concern there could be possibly more victims out there. APD says the victim's family spoke Burmese. Shamsur Alam, a Rohingya immigrant, spoke Burmese too. So we don't know if he's specifically targeting Burmese, but we know he speaks Burmese. We know he speaks other languages. We're worried that there could be these immigrant communities that are hiring this person because he speaks their language that invite him into their home, trusting him. Shamsur Alam is now in the Denver jail facing multiple charges. I don't think the investigation ends here. There's still a lot of work to be done. We want to make sure that our community knows that we, we take these things seriously. Aurora police say if you hired Shamsur Alam, talk to your children. And if you think something might have happened, call police. They say if he does have any other victims out there, they want to find them and make sure that he cannot do this to anyone else. Rachel Krause, 9 News. We're learning more tonight about why a fire chief in Teller County was arrested for domestic violence. Chris Hawkins is the chief of Four Mile Protection District. Arrest documents show that in January, deputies were called out to his house in Florissant for a disturbance. Deputies say Hawkins told them his girlfriend who lives with him hit him in the face, got in her car and drove off. Deputies found her in a parking lot. They arrested her for DUI and domestic violence. Well, last week, deputies say the district attorney's office sent them a video from that night showing Hawkins was the one who actually assaulted his girlfriend. He was arrested for domestic violence and reporting a fake crime. But the Four Mile Protection District says Hawkins is still the fire chief. He's not on leave, and they do not plan on doing an internal investigation. The community in Firestone is looking for a mom who hasn't been home in two days. Police say 51-year-old Rebecca Greenup hasn't been seen since Tuesday. She's a mom of two, grandmother of three. Security video shows her leaving her home in Millican on Tuesday just before noon. An hour later, she was spotted at a bank in Firestone using an ATM where she made a deposit. Now Greenup's daughter is passing out flyers, hoping someone knows where her mom is. We don't have a choice. We have to bring her home either way, and I'd prefer to bring her home and take her to dinner instead of the opposite. Danny says her mother doesn't go anywhere without updating the family. They're looking for a brown Hyundai Tucson with Colorado plates. If you know anything, call Millican police. Denver's former Doubletree Hotel on Quebec turned homeless hotel shelter was back in the spotlight today. Denver's Department of Housing Stability searched the shelter today looking for weapons and any other banned items. Within the last hour, they said they found a dozen rounds and an empty magazine but no firearms. This comes after two people were shot and killed there and another woman was shot over the last few weeks. The Department of Housing Stability says officers were there today as they searched every room, which is part of an agreement. You know, there's a guest services agreement with prohibited items on it for the guests, which includes uh, weapons, of course, um, and, the, and all the guest services agreements have been signed by the guests as well. It also allows for the inspection of the rooms at any time. Since those deadly shootings, the city has installed several security measures, including metal detectors, a badging system, more security personnel, and a stronger DPD presence. With the governor's signature, Colorado just became the second state in the country to effectively ban the use of the controversial term excited delirium. California already passed a similar ban last year. A Nine News investigation last year found this term has been linked to more than 225 deaths across the country, including Elijah McClain. Many medical organizations have debunked the idea of excited delirium, saying this is not a real medical condition, and it's often used to justify excessive force by law enforcement. So this law now bans the term from being used in incident reports or as a cause of death on a death certificate. 
Motorcyclists in Colorado could soon be allowed to ride between the cars that are slow or stopped on the road. State lawmakers passed a bill to legalize something called lane splitting. This bill is now on the governor's desk. If he signs it, motorcycles would only be allowed to move between cars if they are stopped or moving at 15 miles an hour or less. And the law would expire in September of 2027 because lawmakers are hoping over the next three years, CDOT could study if this actually makes our roads any safer. The most important thing here is uh, when a motorcyclist has to react quickly if somebody's swerving in and they do move out the way, it's against the law to do that. And, and they can they can get fined for it. So this is really, really, really a safety bill. Lane splitting is already legal in a couple other states, California, Utah, Montana, Arizona, and Missouri and Rhode Island are now considering a bill to legalize it. Receiving the organ transplants that I got absolutely saved my life. The wait list is impossibly long, so they're now looking to find more kidney donors and maybe shorten that list a little bit. It's hurtful that we pay our rent every month and we have to live like this. You can ride the elevator at this apartment, but you have to knock and yell to make it to your floor. And one of Colorado's very best athletes, maybe the best athlete, headed to the altar? McKaylin Schifrin's getting hitched. We'll be back in 60 seconds. One needs a kidney, one got a kidney, and a third gave a kidney. Connected through the transplant world, all three are now hoping to recruit more people to donate a kidney to someone else. In the corner is the machine that's keeping me alive. In the corner of his bedroom yeah, sits a lifeline for Mark McIntosh. We are good buds every night for about eight hours. At home dialysis that does the work uh, you know, his kidneys now it. can't. This is all the tubing and everything. Tiresome. Do this every night. To be so yeah, tethered. Been doing this now for about two months. There's only one solution that could free Mark from this daily routine. That would be a kidney transplant. Mark is still adjusting to this new life. A longtime Denver sports broadcaster now battling a bone marrow disorder that knocked out his kidneys. I'm like getting a master's degree in the transplant world, you know, and to find out that, oh my gosh, there's 100,000 people out there that need a kidney transplant. So I'm not alone. I hate to contrast Mark <laughs> in such a black and white way, but uh, I feel absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I feel better than I have in easily a decade or more. Randy Weber already got his new kidney, plus a new liver three years ago. Receiving the organ transplants that I got absolutely saved my life and, and I feel feel like I'm in life 2.0. Randy also lived a very different before. A two-time Olympic ski jumper flying through skies around the world. But a few years ago, a vascular disease led to kidney and liver failure and forced him to go find help. It came down to my just total lack of embarrassment talking about kidney failure and the fact that for better or for worse, I had to have a transplant. And I asked everybody. Two people answered the call, his brother and a family friend. He knows he's one of the lucky ones. If you're waiting on the list, you're gonna die on the list. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't say that to be, to be cruel. It's just the reality that we're in. In Mark's search for his own new kidney, he hopes to find even more, launching a new effort called Drive for Five. Drive for Five talks a lot about um, people that consider 
share in their spare. The lofty goal of recruiting 5,000 live kidney donors. <laughs> Randy's ready to help him. What are you doing, girl? How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing great. Along with another we friend. Know our sassy competitiveness. We all have a little bit of that in us. <laughs> this is Chrissy Perm, who is a kidney donor. Chrissy Perm took home three medals in the 92 Barcelona Olympics, but it was her kidney donation to the father of a fellow Olympic swimmer that she says will define her legacy. I feel like sometimes when a door opens and you have an opportunity, you go through it because you can. A donor, a recipient, and a patient still in need. <laughs> they hope their stories will inspire others to consider donating too. Once you do it once, you know, it, it doesn't feel like a big deal. And to have an opportunity to help others, to help a friend like Mark, this is just like the icing on the cake of something that I already felt like I was really proud of. I'm just very grateful for both of you that um, you guys are part of the team. Brought together by their kidney journeys, maybe together, they can move the needle. Okay, thanks guys, have a great night. Have a good night. See you later, thank you so much. She's great, I love yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. Drive for Five is really hoping to recruit older adults, healthy folks, but people who are done having kids. And they're pushing people toward registering through the National Kidney Registry. Just, you know, check it out. Maybe you're curious, maybe you really do wanna do this. By the way, Chrissy, the person she donated to, Dick Franklin, that's Missy Franklin, the swimmer, Missy Franklin's dad. That's yeah. their connection. How cool is that? that it's wonderful. You've done pieces with them. Uh, we, we met them and did stories with them. They did not know each other before. She, she realized they had this swimming connection and said, I'll give him a kidney. Mm -hmm. Changed his life forever. And now Missy's got her dad and most importantly, her daughter's grandpa here. All right. We've got more information on our website if you're interested. Finding Healing Through Art. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and survivors in Denver are finding community through an art show opening tomorrow. This is called the Rise Art Show, founded by local artists in the Blue Bench. All of the artwork is created by people who have survived sexual assault. It's very common, one in two women, one in three men, and one in two trans non-binary individuals, excuse me, will experience sexual assault. The artists in the Blue Bench hope this exhibit will inspire people to come out and take in these survivors' stories and their experiences. Guests came up and told us that they had never disclosed what had happened to them when they were younger and that the art show was giving them a voice to be able to do that. Now we've told you about the Rise Art Show last year. It's only grown since then. This year, the exhibit will be held at the Remain Real Art Gallery in Denver off Santa Fe. It opens tomorrow and runs through April 28th. Most elevators are pretty simple to operate. You press a button, get on, press another button, end up on a new floor. But the process at one Denver apartment complex involves a lot of banging and yelling. I'm on the first floor. Hirschfeld Towers is home to roughly 300 seniors and people with disabilities. Torson Mitchell, who lives on the ninth floor, says the elevator is being manually operated by a guy standing on top of it. And it's been that way for weeks after she says both elevators at the affordable housing high rise broke down. Every time you get on it, this is what's happening. It's dangerous for the person that's on, that's doing it, and it's dangerous for the, for the residents. It is a fire hazard. Denver Fire tells us they're aware of the situation, and while it's not ideal, it is completely legal because the Denver Housing Authority is paying for a licensed technician to operate the elevator while repairs are made. The Denver Housing Authority tells us there is no danger to residents and the elevator is technically working. They say crews are on site working on the issue, but there's no timeline for those repairs to be finished. Big congrats to Colorado native Michaela Schifrin, another Olympian. Uh, she posted this on her Instagram a few hours ago about her partner, Norwegian Olympic skier Alexander Kilda, and what looks to be an engagement ring. Pretty sparkly. <laughs> They're quite the couple, the power couple, and uh, truly supportive of each other, Kathy. Oh, my. A wonderful story to follow. I mean, she's amazing, he's amazing, and now for both of them, we're just so happy.
Yeah, we have a quiet night in Denver, you guys, after a day with temperatures in the mid 70s. We're tracking a weekend storm that's going to bring a lot of wind, increase in fire danger tomorrow, ahead of a system that will bring cooler weather on Saturday and a few rain and snow showers. 75 in Denver, 15 degrees above average, 83 in Lamar, 78 in Greeley today. At the airport, still almost 60 degrees. It's 1020 in the evening. Winds picking up out of the southeast out there. And over some of the higher passes, we're tracking some gusts over 20 and 30 miles per hour. This will be part of our weather story tomorrow. Not a lot of wind, but few gusts out in the northeastern plains over 30 miles per hour. Tomorrow, red flag warning for Denver and eastern Colorado with the potential for winds to 50 miles per hour. And we have that low humidity value between 8 and 10 percent. Critical fire weather tomorrow and then a high wind watch will replace this on Saturday. Front range foothills could see winds 60 to 70 miles per hour on Saturday. Keep that in mind. High profile vehicles travel into the high country. This could bring down trees and power lines. It is a powerful Pacific system. The leading edge already bringing high and mid-level cloud cover to western Colorado, but the main system still off to the west for now. We've had just a glorious couple of days with this big ridge, which is shifting off to the east. It's a fast moving system, but impactful because of the tight pressure gradient between the high that's over us now and the low that's coming in from the west. It'll be dry in Denver tomorrow, but very windy and very warm. Highs in the mid mid to upper 70s, 80s in central Texas, but cool pool of air off to the east and a cool pool of air coming in with that trough for the weekend. High clouds tonight and we'll see rain and snow showers develop in about 24 hours over western Colorado. It's going to take a little time to get that moisture into Denver. Advisories for accumulating snow cover the southern mountains Friday night into Saturday. 7 to 12 inches of snow and blowing snow may be an issue for travelers there. In Denver, we have a few high clouds tonight, a sunny day tomorrow, a windy warm day. We'll see a few rain showers when you wake up Saturday morning, flipping to snow by 11 o'clock on Saturday. Doesn't last very long, but occasional rain and snow showers with wind. Saturday is not going to be a super pleasant day, but it doesn't last all day. And Sunday will be cool and windy, but drier for baseball plant fans. We have mid 40s in Denver tonight, a low of 50 in Lamar, 18 in Leadville, 27 in Steamboat. Your highs tomorrow way above average again, 75 in Denver, 80s in southeastern Colorado. Along the foothills 73 for Boulder and 64 the high in Evergreen tonight in Denver partly cloudy mid 40s when we start there you know it's going to be a warm day a windy warm day with mid 70s and a few clouds a nice day minus the wind and then cooler for the weekend a few rain and snow showers Saturday a dry but cool day Sunday nice on Monday next storm we're tracking comes in Tuesday into Wednesday and let's hope this is a winning forecast for our Rockies on opening day partly cloudy and 75 degrees Sports is next. More on the Rockies coming up.